I'm Neville Agnew with the Getty Conservation Institute, and I'm a co-curator of the exhibition Cave Temples of Dunhuang, Buddhist art on China's Silk Road. Welcome to the Getty Center and to tonight's uh, lecture by uh, Victor Mayer. Uh, the lecture is the start of the symposium, which is entitled Cave Temples of Dunhuang, History, Art, and Materiality, a symposium in honor of the life and work of Fan Jin Se at the Magal Grottoes. Now, in a moment, I will invite my co-curator uh, for the uh, exhibition from the GRI, uh, Marshall Reed, to introduce Victor Mayer. But first, uh, allow me to uh, mention that all four curators for the exhibition are here tonight. Fan Jin Se herself, retired last year, and now Director Emerita of the Dunhuang Academy. Mimi Gates, uh, Director Emerita of the Seattle Art Museum and President of the Dunhuang Foundation. Um, and uh, I would like you in particular to, uh, to um, acknowledge uh, Fan Jin Se and Mimi Gates uh, for their drive and enthusiasm for the exhibition. Uh, without that, it would not have happened. So please, would you acknowledge and, uh, Uh, also, I would like to uh, welcome Wang Shudong, the current director of the Dunhuang Academy, and his uh, colleague, the newly appointed deputy director of the uh, Dunhuang Academy, Zhao Shenliang. Um, also uh, from uh, China, and a speaker tomorrow, I should acknowledge, is uh, Rongshen Zhang from Peking University. Uh, all of these are, are speakers uh, in, uh, tomorrow, I believe. Um, uh, uh, at, the, at the symposium that starts tomorrow officially uh, here and then the second day uh, on Saturday at uh, UCLA. Early on, I approached uh, Lothar von Falkenhausen about the possibility of holding the symposium in collaboration with uh, UCLA. And he was immediately enthusiastic. And he brought together uh, all the departments uh, with an interest in China and uh, and East Asian culture and religion. And we're really very grateful to uh, Lothar uh, and to uh, UCLA. So please acknowledge Lothar van Falkenhausen. <laughs> Finally, uh, it's a, a pleasure to uh, acknowledge uh, the generosity of the exhibition uh, sponsors, notably, uh, there are many of them, but I have to mention in particular the presenting sponsor, uh, which is the Robert H. N. Ho Family uh, Foundation. And there are others that are mentioned in the uh, uh, symposium program. So, uh, we're welcome to all tonight, and uh, we hope you enjoy uh, the lecture by Professor Victor Mayer. And now let me ask my co-curator, Marsha Reed, uh, who's chief curator at the Getty Research Institute, to introduce our speaker. As Neville said, I'm Marsha Reed from the Getty Research Institute, and I want to welcome you and thank you for your interest in the lecture and in the symposium, which we planned on the occasion of the exhibition, The Cave Temples. And unlike the Getty Museum, which you're probably more familiar with, which focuses on European art history, the Getty Research Institute, its scholar programs, its conferences, its publications, has an interest in global culture, the global culture which also took place many centuries ago in Dunhuang, and um, the art and visual culture that came out of that. We're very, very pleased to host the, the exhibition and this conference. And like Neville, I want to thank our many sponsors, particularly the Ho Foundation, and the East-West Bank, without which we probably would not have laid the foundation for this show, as well as the Dunhuang Foundation, our collaborators at the Dunhuang Academy, and UCLA as well. I also want to thank the lenders to the exhibition for their exciting 
amazing loans, which you probably will not have the chance to see again. So this is a one-time opportunity. The British Museum, the British Library, the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, and the Musée Guimet. I want to really thank them for their generosity and for trusting us with these valuable, irreplaceable, non-pare kinds of things that we're showing in the exhibition. To launch the symposium, our keynote speaker this evening is Victor Mer. He's professor of Chinese language and literature at the University of Pennsylvania, specializes in Buddhist popular culture and literature, as well as the vernacular tradition of Chinese fiction and the performing arts. He's edited the Standard Editions, Columbia History of Chinese Literature, the Columbia Anthology of Traditional Chinese Literature. But most pertinent for this symposium, in 2010, Professor Mayer edited the Bowers Museum, and maybe some of you actually were able to take advantage of going to this show. The publication was Secrets of the Silk Road, an exhibition of the discoveries of the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. In, 19, in 2014, he was editor of Reconfiguring the Silk Road, New Research on East-West Exchange in Antiquity, to which he contributed the introduction on reconceptualizing the Silk Roads, because there were many. Tonight, he will focus on Dung Wang's place and role during the Middle Ages. Please welcome Professor Mayer and the beginning, the auspicious beginning of the symposium. Thank you very much, Marcia, for that generous introduction. As I look out at this large audience, um, I'd have to say I'm a little bit overwhelmed because uh, when I started Dunhuang studies back in 1972, very, very few people had ever heard of Dunhuang or been there, uh, in, people in the West. And so it, it's wonderful to see so many people interested in Dunhuang, which has occupied so much of my life. And what I want to do in my talk, my lecture, is give you um, an overview of Dunhuang, its riches, its position in the world, its time, um, because in the next two days in the symposium, we will be looking very, very intensively at particular aspects of Dunhuang, uh, culture, art, literature, and I want to, in this lecture, to give you an idea of how Dunhuang fits into what I would call the Eurasian picture. And that's why I like to look at places like Dunhuang in the context of Eurasia. So, um, the Dunhuang is located about right here. And you can see that's at a very strategic place because um, there is this long corridor leading down into China. These mountains are called the Qilian Shan or Richthofen Range. Now, why are they called the Richthofen Range? Uh, because they were discovered for modern geography by uh, Ferdinand Freiherr von Richthofen. Some of you may know who I'm talking about. He's the Red Baron's uncle. If you read Snoopy, you'll, you'll know all about the Red Baron, who was Manfred Albrecht, Ferd uh, Manfred Albrecht Freiherr von Richthofen. So we have Ferdinand von Richthofen to thank for the name of those mountains as they're known in the West. Um, I also want to note that we have another very important name to be thankful to Ferdinand von Richthofen for, and that is Silk Road. 
because he's the guy who gave the name Silk Road to that east-west trade route. And he did that fairly late, 1877. So it wasn't known as the Silk Road before that. Who knows what it was called? Uh, it was just probably called by various stages. Uh, so the idea, in, in German he called it Die Seidenstraßen, uh, the Silk Roads. And that became Silk Road in English, and in Japanese it's Shirukurodo, <laughs> which I'm sure you can understand. Um, in Chinese it's Sichojulu, which is also a translation of the German English. So this whole industry of Silk Road studies, really we can pay homage to Ferdinand von Richthofen for, for conceptualizing it. So that's why it, at Penn last year, uh, two years ago, I had a, a conference where I tried to reconfigure the Silk Road, reconceptualize it, because it wasn't really always just the Silk Road. Uh, it could have been called a glass road because glass was traded along it from the West. It could have been called a spice road. Uh, spices, very important, were also traded along it. In, in the third millennium, we could have called it, third millennium BC, we could have called it the Bronze Road because bronze was traded along this road. So it's, it's stuck in our minds as Silk Road, but please don't always think of it as just dealing in silk. <laughs> um, so there we have the Richthofen Range or the Tilian Shan. Um, and the, here is what I, uh, I know that as the Gansu Corridor, but most people now call it the Hushi Corridor. The, and Hushi means west of the river the Yellow River, so, because the, the Yellow River takes a big bend here, that's called the Ordos, uh, and then it comes down and goes off this way. So the Chinese like to call that corridor the west of the Yellow River corridor. But I, when I started my studies, I, I knew it only as the Gansu corridor. I never heard of the Hushi corridor. Now, what's interesting about it, it really is a corridor because on the south you have these very high mountains and on the north, right here, you can't really see them well on this map, uh, on this glo global photograph, but there's a, some mountains called Ma Zongshan, which means horse main mountain, the mane of a horse, because they look like that. It's very narrow. Okay, it's a thousand kilometers, a long, long way. And it's most of the way it's, you can see from one side to the other. Um, so it actually would be very easy for the Chinese to keep foreigners from coming in as long as they had a strong military establishments, garrisons. And in one th 111 BC, the... Um, Han Dynasty Emperor Wu Di established a military garrison at Dunhuang. And he, this was pushing China out into Central Asia. And what's very, very interesting is that once China um, established its presence at Dunhuang, it was extremely reluctant ever to give it up. And if you look at historical maps of this region, uh, from the Han Dynasty all the way through history, uh, thousands of, uh, a couple thousand years and more, the Chinese, that sometimes they would push their power out into the Central Asia here until, and they, they, they were sometimes very successful, until they met the Arabs over here and were defeated in 752. And that's when China stopped expanding to the West. Uh, but they would wax and wane their, their power and their control in Central Asia. But the one thing they never wanted to give up was Dunhuang. 
and they, they fought so hard and kept it, except um, for a brief period, about a century, 786 to 848, 786 to 848, when the Tibetans actually took over and controlled this area. And that has a great impact on um, Dunhuang culture because um, the Tibetans were in, in power. They ruled. And so their, their culture, their religion, had a big impact on people and life in this, this corridor. And it, Chinese, believe it or not, Chinese was actually even written in Tibetan script during this period. And some Chinese took Tibetan names. Not all Chinese was written in Tibetan script, but it was done. So this, this Gansu Corridor, um, it's so important because it goes, so out here is the Jade Gate, which is just beyond Dunhuang. Uh, and the Jade Gate is like the last jumping off place before you go out the armed fortress of China before you go out into the desert. I mean, into really no man's land. And then Silk Road splits right around Dunhuang, just beyond, and it goes, you know, there's a northern branch and a southern branch, and you can see what they're doing. They're going along the edges of the Taklamakan Desert or the Tarim Basin. Whoop, I don't know how I did that. Um, so, incidentally, I know this area extremely well because that's where the mummies were found. And that's what, I, so the first 20 years of my career were spent on Dunhuang manuscripts, and I'll tell you about some of them later today, this evening. And the second 20 years was working on the mummies from there. And they're related. You can ask me during the question period how they were related. But they, I wouldn't have done the mummies if I hadn't done Dunhuang first, for sure. Um, so the, the, it's like a funnel leading down into the heartland of China, this Gansu corridor. So if China was weak, you know, the people would pour into here. And right there, where the, the Yellow River takes this big bend, right about here is a place that is now called Xi'an. I think many of you have probably been there. That's where the Terracotta Warriors are. Um, and it was very important during the Tang period and in the Han period as Chang'an, the capital of those dynasties. Except when China was weak, and then the capital would shift over here somewhere to Luoyang, perhaps, to escape from the pressure from Central Asia. Well, you, you know, of course, that China built a great wall, went through there, and that was also to keep people from coming from the northwest. There's always um, nomadic so-called barbarians who were very well armed, knew how to ride horses, had great weapons, um, and, and continually impinging upon China from the Northwest. So that's why, for strategic reasons, and the strategic reasons related to economic reasons, you know, China wanted to hold on to this. And it did, most of the time. It, it looks very strange if you look at historic maps, like there's this part of China, you know, here's China, and sometimes China would extend to the south, but usually it's like here. And this area would just still be there like an arm sticking out into Central Asia. Very important to understand that. So now let's see how Dunhuang fits in with all these trade routes. So there it is. Uh, and you can see how they branch out going different ways. And if you want to get to India, you have to go out around, around the, um, the Tarim Basin to get down into India. And that's where so many 
uh, very serious Buddhist pilgrims went to India through those regions. Some of you probably know names like Xuanzang, who is immortalized in um, Journey to the West, it fictionalized, but that's how we know him. He's called the monk. And he's led, some of you have probably read it, he's led by a, a monkey, the monk and the monkey. So um, he, he was an actual Tang Dynasty monk, and the novel was written later, a fictionalization. So he, he went this way, t traveled down into India from here to get scriptures. So Buddhism came to China from India, uh, and when Chinese wanted better texts, better manuscripts, they went down to India to fetch them. Because it's, in truth, you know, when the Indians came to China, uh, the Chinese would say to them, you know, that some Indian master would come to China, who's the master, famous master of a, a Buddhist sutra, and the Chinese would say, all right, buddy, where's the text? You know, like, was it Mondale who asked, where's the beef? I mean, they, the Chinese really wanted uh, text. The Chinese love written word. And the Indian says, text, what? It's up here. The Indians memorized all their texts. The writing was not a big deal for the Indians. That's why texts like epics like the Mahabharata, Ramayana, the Vedas, they really weren't written down for thousands of years. They were all memorized backwards and forwards. The Indians could memorize texts backwards. And that's why the Indians are such great champs in the spelling bees. <laughs> they probably can spell words backwards. I'm not kidding. They have such incredible mnemonic uh, talents. Um, so, but if you want the real text, you go down to India and get them. And some people stayed there for a long time. Um, one of, oh, okay, I have to say, one of my favorite pieces in this exhibition, it's an incredible exhibition. And it has, well, t I'm getting chills thinking of this because I'm seeing here things that I've known about. Uh, I've seen lots of Dunhuang manuscripts in the raw, in the real, but I'm seeing two things here this time that are just earth shattering for me. One is a portrait, a large portrait of a monk who's got a backpack full of scrolls. And everybody says, oh, that's Xuanzang. But no, it isn't because it's a honky. You know, it's, it's a la wai a guaylo or whatever, you know, it's, it's a, definitely not a Chinese, so how could Xuanzang be uh, one of those guys, a Caucasian? But that portrait evolved into Xuanzang's portrait, and I wrote a paper about that about 25 years ago. Not too many people read it, unfortunately. <laughs> but I think the, the people who wrote the catalog for this ex symposium and exhibition did read it. So they know what that portrait really is. It's not Xuanzang, uh, but it's the precursor of Xuanzang. So, uh, that, you know, they, there is a beautiful portrait of Xuanzang, that, but it's much later that looks almost exactly like iconographically, iconographically down to the tiger next to his foot and to the little Buddha on a cloud above his head and the scrolls and that. Well, I can talk about that portrait for an hour, no sweat, but I won't. Too many other things to talk about. Uh, but the other manuscript here, you see, I'm, I'm a text person, I'm sorry. I am a philologist and I like to read text. But I mean, most of the people involved with this exhibition are art historians and archeologists. So I, it's okay, they can do their part and I'll do mine. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> So I, the other manuscript here, I'm going to tell you right now, is Paleo 4524. I dreamed about Paleo 4524 
for 20 years in a row, and here I can see it. You should be so happy that you can see this manuscript that I drooled over for 20 years. And, you know, I wanted that manuscript so badly that uh, the Bibliothèque Nationale, where it's housed, um, made a facsimile a long time ago. And I think they only made 200 copies. It was very, very hard to get. And I said that, I told book dealers, I said, I will pay $10,000 if you get me a copy of that facsimile. I won't tell you how much I paid for it, but I did get one and I have it. And I love it, but here's the real thing. You can see it. And I, I, when I was asked by Neville Agnew, you know, to give this talk, uh, this lecture, I responded very quickly. I said, I want to talk about Paleo 4524. He says, don't you think that's a little bit too narrow and esoteric? <laughs> to me it wasn't, because I think that manuscript, I will say a little bit about it later, but you know, that manuscript can tell us so many precious things about what we need to know about the development of fiction and drama in China from the ninth century on. Without that manuscript, we would be ignoramuses, and we were ignoramuses until that manuscript was found and published. So I spent 20 years essentially working on that manuscript, and it's here. You all look at it carefully. Okay. So now we'll pay a little bit more attention to particular spots out there. Um, so we come up through the Gansu Corridor, and then we get to Dunhuang, and then, as I said, there's the Jade Gate out here. And you've probably seen some of these names before, Lolan, Tarim, uh, Turpan, Turpan, Good Melon, oh, Hami is, where, no, Hami, where's Hami? Should be a Hami. Anyway, that's where there's great melons. And um, so, one thing I want to tell you is that there were other sites, very important sites, with caves and art in them. Uh, Kucha here at the Kizil Caves. And there were caves here outside of Turpan, Bezek Lake, for example, in Sengim. So this, this idea of caves, it's all over Central Asia, and it goes down into India, where you've probably all heard of places like Ajanta, uh, so this is where the idea of having cave shrines, cave temples, caves for worship, caves for meditation. But Dunhuang is more spectacular than any of these other sites. And amazingly, you'll see that there was not really much effort at preservation for over a thousand years. Somehow, things survived. And even though they were very delicate and they were exposed to the elements, and you'll see why in a moment, um, they're here and you have these wonderful replicas uh, that you can go into and get a sense of what it's like to be in them. Or you can see this, um, this visual immersion that you can go through and just, you feel like you're being drawn into the cave. So miraculously they survived but I think it's partly because of the remoteness of Dunhuang. You know, it's just so far away. It's hard to get to. I gotta get my watch out and start thinking of time. Okay, uh, so it's really difficult to get there. It's very remote. So I remember when I first started to go to Dunhuang in 1981. Well, okay, so how many people in this room have been to Dunhuang? Hold up your hand. A lot, a lot, a lot. Okay, I was probably, after the great Western explorers of the early 19th century, uh, early 20th century, I was one of the first Americans to go out there. Uh, and to get there, I had to take a train from Lanzhou. It, it took about two days, I guess, a day and a half at least, and it was a very, very smoky train. No electric trains then. And I remember 
when the train would go around a curve like this, and the smoke from the engine would be coming like this, your car would be full of, full of soot. Okay, now how do you get there? You fly, plop. You don't really have a sense of how hard it is to get there. Now, I rode on a steam train. But before people rode, I mean, I'm not going to talk about people who went out in motor cars or horses. I'm going to talk about people who went out walking. You know, that took months. And it was a lot of people died on the way. So one way archaeological treasures get preserved is that nobody goes and bothers them. No, there's no looting. But I can tell you, as soon as, especially nowadays with GPS and all, as soon as an archaeological discovery is announced, the looters will get there before the archaeologists, I guarantee you. Uh, it happened out in Xinjiang with all of the sites that I worked on. I mean, sites that are in the middle of the desert, really hard to get to, the, the looters can get there and destroy them and damage them and send their, the, the goods off to Hong Kong to the antiquities market. And then it ends up in America or in Germany or in wherever there's money to buy it. Uh, so Dun Huang, uh, I also want to say is that it's not just one place here. There, there are cave sites. <clears throat> okay, so there are cave sites all around it, but, and I'll show you in a moment. That, uh, there, that one, but I'll show you first this. This is, this is the long Gansu corridor from Lanzhou. All the way out here is a thousand kilometers. That's a lot of distance. And it's very thin, very narrow. So Chinese things would go out to the west. So all the way to Rome. And Western things would come down in here. Uh, so basically, why is there a Dunhuang? It's, a, it's like a caravanserai, a, a, a caravan center where people could rest and refresh and um, get new horses and new mounts, new carts, new camels, and then move on. So a lot of the things we see at Dunhuang, many of them in the exhibition, are a function of the nature of the site, that it's really just a big caravan center, a big trade center. But it's, it's not a huge emporium. It's a population, I, I don't know, now maybe 100,000 or so, but that's much, much greater than it was uh, in the Tang Dynasty and before. Probably 5,000, 10,000. I don't know the, the population figures, but it's not very much because you'll, you'll see it's in the middle of a desert. So there are all these sites along the road. And then... When you get out there, you see there are, there's this very important site called Yulin. So sometimes we call a number of the sites around here uh, Dunhuang Caves or Dunhuang Grottoes, not just this site. That one is where it's got a couple of names. Uh, it's, it's one site in the Dunhuang area, but it's the most spectacular site and it's the most important site. It's the site that is a World Heritage Site. So it's called Mo Gao, Mo Gao Ku. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about Mo Gao Ku, the name Mo Gao. When I first heard it as a graduate student, I didn't like the sound of it. It sounded wrong because Mo Gao means there's nothing higher. And actually that's hill is not very high. And I thought, this is a, a dumb name, or it's a terribly exaggerated name. So for 45 years, 50 years, I've always been saying, I don't like the sound of that name. Mo Gao Ku, the non-higher caves. And I see a lot of Dunhuang specialists looking very bemused at Victor Mayer saying this. 
Because everybody says mo gao ku, and I don't think anybody knows what it means. But I'm, if in the question period you want to ask, I'll tell you. <laughs> I don't want to waste my time now telling you because it's a little complicated. Um, but you can see how people struggled with the meaning of the name because sometimes it's translated in, in, into English as peerless. Or here's, here's one that really sounds silly to me. A site high up in the desert. There's no way you can get that from Moga except high. But it says not higher, nothing higher. Um, anyway, that's what everybody knows it as, Mogao Ku. You know, the Mogao case, you don't even translate it. Because if you try to translate, you're going to say something silly. Um, they, so they, you, it's just one of the sites. Now, where is it located? These sand dunes, which you can climb up, and they're very high and very fun, and you climb up five steps and slip down ten steps. And they're called Mingsha Shan, and the mountains behind them are even higher. Mingsha Shan, Mingsha, you can translate. <laughs> it means whistling sands, the mountain of whistling sands. And if you go out there uh, in the right weather, you can hear this, the, the dunes are whistling. So that's a good name, very good name. Uh, and this is called uh, the Crescent Lake. So Dunhuang Mogalku is over here. And you know, tourists like to go here and get their picture taken on camels. There's a Chinese Hollywood movie set out here where they make films somewhere. It's a very picturesque place. Um, and it's looking really good now. Sometimes when I visited there, this lake was totally dried up, or just a little puddle. So they're taking good care of it now. That's called Crescent Lake. You can see why. Um, and there's another site from the other side. So I would be standing toward the Mogalku side here. Okay, now we're going to look right at the caves, Mogalku. And you can see this is in winter, it's taken in January. And uh, these caves don't look very impressive, do they? Uh, they have very few paintings in them, very, a couple of simple paintings. Uh, but they're quite extensive, actually. They stretch on. This is in the northern sector of the whole site. The main sector, the main section is down this way. So what do you have here? Those are basically like the, the workers' quarters or maybe meditation cells for not wealthy monks, but people who were serious about meditation. So they, they weren't ornately decorated. They weren't patronized by very wealthy families. And there's a scholar in the audience here tonight. Where's Sarah Fraser? Hold up your hand. There she is. She's done a lot of work on these caves. Uh, you know, what went on here in the workshops at Dunhuang, how they actually made the, uh, the paintings down in, whoop, down in Brentwood, or the nice sections of the cave. You know, the really fine, fancy caves are down here. But somebody had to make them. And this, there's a river in front of the site, you can see it, that goes right in front. So that's, this is how you uh, irrigate this little oasis. Essentially, it's a, uh, it's a, then in front of Mogalku, there's an oasis. And that's where people like Director Fan live, <laughs> in that oasis. But sometimes, this it looks little stream, it looks fairly benign. It gets very, very fearsome. It, it can become a flood overnight. I mean, a raging flood that will go up over here. And that's because the water from the Chidan Shan and other mountains around, when it melts, this becomes a rage, raging river. So it's not always just for irrigation. It's something that like can ruin some of the caves. It can ruin roads. 
I got stuck in the middle of one once. We couldn't go forward, we couldn't go back. It was very, very scary because there were like raging floods on either side of us in the middle of the desert. And there's another angle from those uh, of the northern side, some more up closer. Nothing elaborate, but they, they would have looked a lot nicer in, in uh, a thousand years ago, a thousand, two, three hundred years ago. But you can see a lot of them have wooden posts sticking out. And that was, you can see all these post holes. That would be for a roof overhanging us, okay? So all the wood structures have disappeared, but they, they would have had elaborate fronts. And there's one cave we'll see uh, with a huge standing Buddha, uh, a seated Buddha inside of it, very, very high. That in front of it still has, of course, with many rebuildings, all the wood structure, and it's very, very impressive. You have to imagine that all of these caves at one point would have had roofs and porticos, and they would look more like a temple. So there's, there's that big cave I was talking about. And this is an old historic photograph. Somehow they managed to rebuild this. You know, the, this site was basically abandoned after the Mongols swept through there in 14th, 13th, 14th century. It had been a very flourishing site from about 366, even earlier, uh, until around the 13th, 14th century. It ever, Several reasons, I can't go into all of them, but one was uh, the Mongols mm, rearranged things. They had a Pax Mongolica, so they took over trade and everything. And also, coming from the West were Arabs, Muslims. What should I say? Uh, Muslim, Islamicized Turkic people. And they just took over Central Asia from the 11th century to the 14th century, by the 14th century, all these Buddhist sites were defunct. And you know, we're very lucky to have any manuscripts because when the Muslims got them, they tore them up. They burned them. They used them for fertilizer. And we have the actual sites in Central Asia where this, the remnants of the destruction. So um, another thing that caused damage at Dunhuang was when the white Russians came there and camped out. Some white Russians actually stayed there, and it was bitter cold in the winter. Uh, they would light fires. They stayed in the caves. So you will see some smoke damage. One of the replicas up here has accurately depicted smoke damage from that would have probably come from white Russian occupation. I mean, they didn't mean to be nasty and destroy, but it happened. So I'm going to start going faster now because I'm going to leave you time. We got started late. And not, I'm not going to give up all my time. I'll probably talk till at least... Um, I gotta, I'm using Philadelphia time, just a minute. Uh, eight eight o'clock, is that all right? Yeah. I will talk till about eight, and then you can ask questions for 10 or 15 minutes. But I'm going to move fast now. This always happens in my lectures, always. Okay, so there's another historic photograph, and you can see what the caves were like, um, maybe let's say 100 years ago. And uh, they had no fronts on them. Now these are the real nice caves with a lot of artwork inside, in statues. There were 2,400 surviving statues in these caves. And hundreds of thousands of square meters of painting. Here's my guy. He's cute, isn't he? His name is Wang Yanlu, and he, he called him, he was the self-appointed caretaker of these caves. Nobody else was looking after them. And I say, you know, I really appreciate him. But you know, when I said that in Hong Kong, people got mad at me. They said, no, he's a traitor. He gave manuscripts to Westerners. Anyway, that's Wang Yan Lu, and he, he's often called Taoist Wang. I don't even know if he's a real Taoist. He, that's his name, it's called Wang Dao Shi. And he is standing outside. Am I yelling too loud in that? 
Is it okay? Okay. Uh, he is standing outside my Mecca, cave 17. Actually, that is cave 16, but inside there, there is a, a small cave where the manuscripts were discovered. And he discovered them in 1900. Uh, and I'll show you exactly how he discovered them and what the situation was like. Now, this is Sir Mark Arl Stein, who is a Hungarian archaeologist working for the British. And he worked, his dates are 1862 to 1943, and he always had with him a dog named Dash. Now, since he worked for 50 years, Dash couldn't have lived that long. But he had seven dashes <laughs> in, in succession. So he, he was a lifelong bachelor, and he devoted himself totally to archaeology. And he was, there were others who got there before him, uh, but he was the first serious archaeologist who knew what he was looking for. So he, guess what? He told Wang Daoshi that he was a reincarnation of Xuanzang. <laughs> Woo, that's pretty smart. And he got his way into the caves. Well, I don't know if he got in, but the manuscripts came out to him. And he looked over them very carefully and took back thousands of them to the British, what was then the British Museum. Now those manuscripts are in the British Library. When I went to re see the manuscripts in London, I went to the British Museum, not to the British Library. They were still there. I'll tell you something maybe in the question and answer period about you know, what's going on with the manuscripts in uh, Britain now and in the world. So the other, this is my God, Paul Pelliot. I worship him. He's the guy who found P4524. He, he knew enough to take that. And uh, see, the thing about, um, th you know, who, what, who, what might have happened to it? Wang Daoshi might have sold it to some county magistrate or given it as a birthday present to somebody. And then we wouldn't have it and we wouldn't know the history of Chinese literature. I'm serious. So, Paul Palio, he's a god. He knew all the languages that were necessary to study the manuscripts from there. I, I just named some of them, Tibetan, Persian, Arabic, Chinese, Turkic, blah, 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 blah. He knew them. And so he read the manuscripts uh, at a phenomenal rate. He went into the little cave and he must have read like one a minute for I don't know how many days and weeks. And he picked the best ones. My gosh. I was going to say my God, but I don't swear. So, <laughs> my goodness. He is an amazing, phenomenal human being. And I dedicated my second book to him, I think. My first book was to my, my father. Okay, now you will see this photograph a lot of times during this symposium. I didn't know everybody else was going to be showing it, but I think at least four or five other people. It deserves to be shown again and again and again. Because there he is, kneeling down in this cave, all stuffed with manuscripts, reading them. You can't imagine how hard that would be. All the dust, they're all wrapped up in these scrolls, thousands of scrolls. He looked at them and picked the best ones very judiciously. Because you have to understand that there are many sutras that were copied hundreds of times. He passed them up, unless the calligraphy is fantastic. What he was after were things, he's so brilliant, he was after things that told us about society, law, economy, culture, all the great stuff that transformed our study of China. Every aspect, law, you name it, religion, climatology, anything. It's all there in those manuscripts, and he picked the ones that tell us about that. 
Of course, Stein got some of them too, uh, but Stein was not able to read Chinese. Stein was a great Sanskritist, and he could read uh, languages in Central Asian uh, scripts. Remember, now, just while you're looking, look at those leaves. Pay very close attention to that painting on the wall. It will come back later. I've got to move fast. Oh, it'll come back real soon. <laughs> because that's cave 17. So this was all walled up probably in the early 11th century, 11 after, let me see, after 1002, sometime before 1035. This was walled up, sealed over. And uh, the only way we knew about this cave, which was stuffed to the gills with manuscripts, it's small, you know? I'm going to shout. Okay. times uh, but it's a treasure house it's like it's more important than the Dead Sea Scrolls of R2 Christianity and Judaism much more important in terms of the contents the Dead, Dead Sea Scrolls of China you know the Dunhuang manuscripts of China so who's that guy in there that guy is Hong Bian and this is a stele about him, so we know a lot about him. And there's those, remember I said look for the, uh, the leaves. So the manuscripts were just piled up in here. Now, after the manuscripts were taken away, taken to St. Petersburg, to Japan, to, I even have four in Philadelphia. They, were, they went all over the world, okay? Uh, Manuscripts were sold off. And I keep coming upon manus Dunhong manuscripts in very unlikely places. Um, so when this room was full of manuscripts, um, his statue was moved away, probably by Wang Daoshi. No, it had to be even earlier because uh, as soon as it was filled up with manuscripts, they had to move somewhere else. Hong Bian was a, his, um, de, he died in 862, so you can get a sense of when he lived. Okay, now I'm just going to show you a few of the monumental Buddhas. There are, couple, there are several colossal Buddhas, and they make you think of Bamiyan. Remember Bamiyan? Blown up by the Taliban. So the function of the, these gigantic Buddhas, they're in Yungang and Boyang, uh, they're in Lushan, Sichuan, you know, there are these gigantic Buddhas that they're there as a kind of road sign or it's like a cross for, a big cross for Christianity. It's like, here's a Buddhist site. You're, if you're a Buddhist, you're going to be welcome here. And you can see it from tens of miles away. They're so big. Um, you can see they just soar up, 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 and th this ceiling is very nicely decorated. Um, another one, different one, and this one is more exposed. This, uh, this one is inside of a nine, it's now nine stories high, cave 96, uh, built at the instigation of Empress Wu, the only female emperor in the history of China, uh, in uh, 695. It's 35.5 meters high. Really, really huge. And now this is called a Pari Nirvana, Buddha entering into eternal sleep. And these can be very long, reclining, we also call them reclining Buddha. So, in the back, you can see all the mourners, and they are people of many different ethnicities. Some of them, you can't see, I can't point them out, some of them are gouging their face 
and we know these uh, rights of Central Asian peoples. This one is huge. Uh, I think it is uh, over 15 meters long. In, but again, the, the cave is very beautifully decorated. Uh, another name for the cave is, uh, the caves are Chen Fo Dong. That means Thousand Buddha Caves. And this name, Thousand Buddhas, is something that was used all over uh, Central Asia and in India. So here we have the, the mourners are depicted as statues, sculpture. And there's a painting of, of uh, a reclining Buddha. Not really going to go fast. Okay, this is a wall painting that shows a site hundreds of kilometers away, which shows the international dimensions of Dunhuang, its relationship to pilgrimage routes. This is, uh, shows the site of Wu Taishan. Some of you have probably been to Five Terraces Mountain. And very conveniently, we have cartouches which tell us, label what the different buildings are, which monasteries and so forth. So we know there's a connection between Dunhuang and Wu Taishan, and a Columbia University PhD about 30 years ago wrote about songs that were found at Dunhuang that were about Wu Taishan. And there's a close-up. And you can see there are a lot of lovely little details about things going on, daily life, religious life. Okay, so this is, five, there are 500 bandits being tr turned into saints, arhats, in this cave. Here we have a battle for Buddha's relics. Um, here's a hunting and fishing scene. Fishing, hunting, so all kinds of daily life. Another hunting scene. Um, that's from a ceiling, Cave 249. Cultivating the land and um, butchering animals. This is a paradise of Amitabha. This is a Bodhisattva of the savior of the red lotus. And you can see it's, it's a close-up of uh, musicians. So we can learn about, a lot about the different kind of instruments that were used at that time. Uh, here's a very close-up. You probably know this is the pipa. That's an Iranian instrument. Many of these instruments come from Iran. Um, then we have a devotional print. This is in the British Museum. A woodblock print. Uh, and so, you know, printing, printing charms turned into the earliest printing in the world. And this is the world's oldest printed book. It's here. Its date is 868, the Diamond Sutra, the world's earliest printed book. Um, you can see some of the calligraphy is exquisite. This is from the Heart Sutra. And then you, have, you also have Taoism represented there. This is a Taoist text. You see the paper is often uh, yellow. Uh, and okay, here I'm going to reluctantly go very, 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 very fast. That's Paleo 4524. A small part of it. And. I, I'll come back and give you a week-long lecture on it. I'll tell you the whole story. It is really a great story, very exciting. I can't even, you know, actually there's one member of the symposium who's gonna talk about one tiny detail and fabulous paper that I know is gonna happen in the next few days about, well, you come and see it, okay. They're all, what, what's happening, there's a magic contest between Shariputra and these heretics, these horrible Indian-looking heretics. And Shariputra should look like an Indian, but here he looks like Chinese. Ha, ha, ha. So they, they're having a contest of magical transformations. Out of their minds, 
they project all of these things and whichever transformation beats the other transformation, then that really impresses the king. And, he, and then they, they say, okay, Shadi, and then they beat a gong or the, a drum and Shadiputra gets a point and he always wins. Oh, that, we're gonna hear a lot about that in, in one of the later papers. Uh, I saw the slides, they're amazing. So there's Shariputra, there's a gong saying, Shariputra wins again because his lion defeated that buffalo. And look how magnificent his lion is, all those colors and everything. He made it up out of his mind. That's what transformation's all about. You can produce something out of nothing. And the monkey was very good at that. Monkey did 72 of those. He had 72, ha ha, that's just a magic number. Don't take it literally. So there it even says, this is the king. Now it's torn off here, but we know there were other scenes. And uh, there are all sorts, I don't have time to talk about that. It's very sophisticated in terms of its depiction and like people looking forward to the next scene. I call this the forerunner of cinema. If you speed this up, you have a film. If you turn the scroll really, really fast, you've got a film. That's really basically what happened. This, this, the guy who did this one maybe didn't know how to write Chinese. He didn't write King. I mean, it was written by, it was painted by different uh, artists. Now, on the back, there are verses that relate to what's on the front. But the people who performed these texts were illiterate women. So those verses wouldn't have meant anything to them. But I wrote a huge long paper about that and it would take me another hour and a half to explain how I know that the women weren't consulting this when they did their performances. So that's the last scene on the scroll would have been this, which is on the wall of some of the Dunhuang caves, which is Shariputra, uh, well, okay, he makes a big tree, a huge, spectacular, magnificent tree to impress the king. And Shariputra just calls up the wind god who has a thing like a bagpipe and blows the tree down. So you can see the whole, his whole canopy is getting blown over. That's the climax. This is the uh, uh, remains, uh, fragments of a book cover. Okay, there's, whew, whew, I'm almost done. Uh, that's what the caves look like now. Joe and Lai protected the caves from the Red Guards and the Chinese government has invested a lot of money in building these stairways that make it easy to get around even to third level sometimes. And this is like to protect the caves from flooding. There you can see detail of the, what it's like. And there is the nine story um, Buddha inside of there, cave 96. And that's what the whole front would have looked like when it was beautiful, you know, with all the woodwork and the railings and the porticos and the roofs. See how nice that is? That didn't come from the Tang Dynasty. It's been rebuilt again and again and again. But somehow or other, we still have this one. Now you have to imagine there were 492 of these caves all up and down. Okay, I gotta let you ask me a few questions. entertaining and uh, uh, elucidating uh, uh, lecture. Uh, time is advancing, so we only have time for two questions, I'm afraid, because the team outside is, uh, is closing down. So um, I didn't say how long or short questions could be, but we have to two.
Thank you, Professor Mayer, for the illuminating lecture. Is that Imre? Yes, it's me. Hi, Imre. Hi. <laughs> I wanted to ask, what does Mogal mean? <laughs> uh, okay, going to, I'm going to give like a one and a half minute rejoinder, reply. Uh, there's a book published in my series at Penn Press by San Ping Chen, Chen San Ping. It's called Multicultural China in the Early Middle Ages. On page 149, you will see his explanation, which I think is cogent and powerful and persuasive, and that is that it comes from an Iranian word, baga, which means lord or duke. Uh, uh, it basically means a lord or a deity. So it's like the, the caves of the deities. And he gives, he gives some philological evidence for that in terms of an early monastery that was at the site that was called the Temple of the Cliff of Saints. So I think it's the most persuasive thing, like Baga, Baga, which could be like Moga. Both labials at the beginning. Okay, one more. Better be, better be a good one. A really brilliant question, please. Somebody over there had, don't be bashful now just because I said it has, it has to be brilliant. Okay, Sarah, oh, 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 two members of the symposium. I wanted the public. So there's supposed to be something like at least 17 caves in the Dunhuang, uh, sorry, uh, temples, freestanding temples in the uh, Dunhuang area, 17 uh, freestanding oh, oh, tem temples. temples. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah. And, but their location is not well understood, and there's some references in the manuscripts to Shang and Xia Ku. And so uh, what's your feeling? Are, were um, there are just a few... Uh, temples in front of the caves, and then there were many in, in um, the general Surrounding region? Area. Or, um, yeah, w um, what's the disposition of the location and t your feeling? Yeah, well, some of the caves were right there. I mean, some of the temples were right at the site, <clears throat> but some of them were dispersed around. And, you know, we have a Korean monk who went through there and has made records of what he saw. And we have, in the cave library, the library, we have manuscripts. We know they came from certain caves. It says, I mean, certain temples. It says the name, a lot of the manuscripts were moved there from certain particular temples. So, uh, I don't think all of those 17 temples were right there at the site. Because, you know, you have the town, which is, 40, 50 kilometers away, and it takes some time to get there. I, I want to give Alan Kennedy a chance to ask a question, if he has one. He came all the way from Paris. Maybe. <laughs> I'll be very, very quick. You know, the, it tells us, I wrote a book called Painting and Performance. You go read it. But I'll tell you the distillation of the Painting and Performance book, and that is there's a very intimate relationship in Chinese literature between text and painting, text and picture. Whoops. Uh, illustrated manuscripts that goes all the way up to the Ming and Qing. So this is really showing us the relationship between illustration on the front and text coming out of the mouth of the speaker. And I have, I'll give you one, one hint. You, know, you probably heard of the Zheng He, the great admiral of the Chinese. He went down to Indonesia and he had a secretary called Ma Huan. They were all Muslims. And he, Ma Huan saw something there and he related it to something in China, and it was an illustrated manuscript. It was an illustrated story, storytelling. So basically what I'm saying is, 
Without Paleo 4524 manuscript, we wouldn't understand where this intimate relationship between text and painting came from. This is the beginning of it. We just would not. It has to do with storytelling. Okay? That's all I have time for. <laughs> that brings us to an end of this evening's uh, wonderful lecture by uh, Professor Mayer. Please do thank him again and uh, have a good evening. Thank you.